Are you ready? I'm ready. Oh, man. He's ready. Wow. Okay, I got to get my act together. I'm very excited. John Peckman Podcast. Coming to you from Connecticut Valley School of Music and Dance. Beautiful downtown Portland, Connecticut. Come over the bridge. Go through one set of lights. Start looking left. You can't miss us. We are here today with very excited. In the building, in the room, we have not only the drummer, but the singer from Wrong Black Bag. Oh, my God. Finally. No kidding. <laughs> Christine made the mistake of telling me. Yeah, yeah. All right. His name is Mr. Vic Steffens. He is here. Hello. Finally. I can't believe After it. After weeks and weeks. We, try a year. This is 52. 52 weeks. 52 weeks. Wow. Really glad to have you here. Nice to be here. Yeah, man. All right. So just so if anybody knows, Vic... Pretty, I would say, created me, pretty much. Well, I think apart from she had something. Oh, my to do mom's with also it. okay. Yeah, so yeah. we have a peanut gallery. Christine Ullman is here off camera. My friend Don Moores is here off camera. My mom is here off camera over here. She's gonna be the cop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she might have to say a word or two at some point. But Vic, I know Vic. I wandered in, or my parents wandered into a music store in Wallingford looking for drum lessons and Vic was the guy right and that's how it all you were like I think eight maybe probably it could know. have been something like that yeah yeah Vic was the drum teacher around Wallingford that's all I knew but what I didn't know was whatever else he got up to the whole stuff a lot stuff of stuff yeah well tell us what you do now what I do now is uh, I run Horizon Music Group in West Haven Connecticut which is a fantastic facility for recording music for bands soloists whatever shows up far out um I you've been there for years for you know 32 years in that location wow believe it or not. that's wild um <clears throat> we're involved in not just recording but we do a lot of artist development and you know try to bring move people up the food chain is what i call it yeah uh, as much as we can and it's not easy but it's rewarding and fun and the people are great. So it's well worth doing. Yeah. And you've been doing that forever. Weeks and weeks. <laughs> yeah. Weeks plus months plus no, decades. Plus, yeah, plus, yeah. Yeah. Something like 15, 1600 weeks, I think. Yeah. Right something there, so. like that. I mean, I, I not just speaking for myself, I'm sure anybody who watches this, there are countless people that owe you so much for what you've done for everybody. Apparently. No, no, <laughs> yeah. there's no apparently it's true. It's true. Everybody knows that. I thought I was the only one. And then sometimes you have these things you'll see on Facebook. And you go, wow, Vic helped everybody. You helped everybody. Well, not everybody, but, well, you know, here's the way I look at it. You know, when I was uh, kind of moving out of the band business, the drumming business, and into the recording business, I stumbled on some people that helped me immensely. Um, Marty Kugel was okay. a name that some people in Connecticut might or might not, but what the song Mighty, Marty Kugel produced In the Still of the Night. Oh, okay. The famous so, Five Satin song. Exactly. He produced it in the basement of a church in New Haven. And that song put us on the map. Yeah, right. And I um, was sort of looking for a lifeline as to what I was going to do in the business, and honestly, I was just lost. Mm. And I opened up the New Haven Advocate one day, and I saw an advertisement for this thing called the... Business Academy of Music. Now, I'd never seen anything like this wow. anywhere. And it it was like a course. Uh, it was like a weekend. They would go from town to town and, and go to a hotel and take a conference room. And for $350, he would tell you how the damn thing works. You know, because mm. even though I had done a lot of things and been involved in a lot of things, I really didn't know how it worked. Because people at, at that point in time didn't want to tell you. And what year would this have been? Uh, 19... 76 maybe oh wow yeah, okay maybe maybe a little later all right so you were in the band so we'll we'll get back to that you were already playing yo yeah i had been playing forever you know yeah, in yeah, fact yeah. what happened was i took this guy's course uh, i actually drove to boston to do it because i had just missed it in new haven and they were they were going to boston so i went to boston wow. and i signed up for it and i took it and after the the middle of the second day he pulled me aside and says who are you you've you know way more than anybody in this room. Hey. And you've obviously done many more things. And I had done a lot more things. I mean, we had been at Trot and Recording. Sure. We had recorded stuff for Andrew Lou Goldham and diff this guy and that guy. We yeah, had yeah, done yeah. a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, I left there and I just 
they controlled every aspect of what we did. So when I left, I realized I had no clue about anything. You mean tried? Yeah. Okay. Because you know, they were the management company. Sure. And, sure. Uh, you know, one way that you control people is you just do everything for them. And then sure. when they need to do something for themselves, they're like, uh, what do I do? Sure. My mom just stopped controlling me recently. Uh, well, I don't blame her. Now my wife controls me. Yeah. Well, well yeah. somebody's got it. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so he said, okay, well, I, I see that, you know, first of all, when, when we get back to New Haven, I want you to come see me. And uh, bring your contract with you. I want to see what you did with them. And so yeah, I, I brought him the contract. He left. He just was laughing hysterically. He said, did you oh, ever no. read this thing? Oh, yeah, I no. said, well, I didn't read it because we were all family. He said, well, the first thing you have to learn about the business is that when somebody tells you you're family, they're probably going to rape you. And so, and, and that was made so much sense to me, you know. So he read the whole thing. At the end of the day, he said, here's a phone number. Call this person. He's doing a big recording thing. He needs some help. If you help him, he'll help you. And that was Paul Lecca. Okay. Uh, Paul Lecca had written uh, Na Na Hey Hey Goodbye mm-hmm. and the song uh, Green Tambourine. Yep. Both were big hits. Mm-hmm. And, and he was a, a CBS guy, ex-CBS. He totally independent of the Five Satin scene. Yeah, yeah. But, this, yeah, but he was friends with him. Sure, sure. And Paul was renovating a huge mansion in Sharon, Connecticut. Okay. Up in the northwest corner of the state. And he needed help, you know, so... People would come up there and they would plaster and paint and do all. So we were up there and he would pay you not with dollars, but with studio time at his place in Bridgeport, which is Connecticut Recording Studios, which at the time was really one of the most active real studios in Connecticut. I mean, they were making records. They, I mean, you know, Will Lee was the studio bass player along with Scott Spray and uh, Alan Schwartzberg would come up and play drums and he's, it was just fantastic. And I ultimately ended up becoming the studio manager there. I see. And being the studio drummer for a while. Right. So that was going on. And then, so that that whole little thing of seeing that thing in the New Haven Advocate kind of put me on a track that made a lot more sense. You know? Yeah, right. And he was so knowledgeable and he just shared everything. Hey, that's cool. So I've always felt that later in life, I should do the same thing. If somebody, gotcha. you know, if I can cool. help you, I'm going to help you. Because cool. somebody helped me, I, you know. That's great. Yeah. So you learned more from that hookup than you did from the actual course? Or was the course helpful too? No, the course was helpful. I mean, yeah. it explained a lot of things that, you know, uh, again, like I said, people didn't want to tell you that stuff back then because they thought it was their private little world, you know. That, right. And if they knew, they could sell it to you instead of you going to get it yourself, you know? So I got you. it was really the start of what ultimately became home studios and right. people trying to do things independently outside of the studio mechanism, right. you know, which was a very, it could be really good for you if you're Bruce Springsteen, nobody's going to argue, but, but yeah, a lot yeah, of people yeah. got lost in that system and, and yeah. never got out. So huh. um, I was happy to have it and I was fortunate to have it if so it was worth happened, it it was I, I never would have got out without it huh. I mean I was really at a point of just like I just can't figure out how this works you know yeah yeah I mean I could go and play a bar with yep. a band sure yep. that's easy sure you know but when it came time to getting farther um I just needed a lifeline and and those guys provided it so. and by farther you mean like just having something that could be published or yeah published or, or get a record how do you get a record company you know right how do you get you know, I always remember like trying for ages to get like A&R guys at record companies on the phone once I, yeah, I built right. a home studio at some point and I was actually making some stuff. And, and I just remember one day I called <laughs> my, my greatest story. I called, I couldn't get anybody on the phone cause they won't talk to you, you know? So I right. finally I said, you know, if I call them maybe at five thirty, maybe their secretary will go home and they'll pick up the phone. Oh, now you're thinking. And you know what? I was right. So I, <laughs> so I called, I was calling this guy, uh, Clifford something, I forget his name. He was a CBS guy. And I called him. Lo and behold, he picks up the phone. You know, he's like, so, so, you know, so he's like, okay, so what do you do? So I'm, I'm a producer from Canada. He says, no, stop. What do you really do? <laughs> you know, because he knew that I was, that I had no clue, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was just like, well, what do you mean? What do you really do? I said, like, well, well, I'm a producer. Said, well, if you're a producer, what have you produced? Yeah, right. Said, well, I haven't really, so you're not a producer. <laughs> So the whole thing was just hilarious, but but he was cool about it. You know, he yeah, wasn't yeah, being yeah. mean. Yeah, he was just trying to say, you know, maybe you should present it a little bit differently. You know, so that phone call was worth it. It was even just for that. It was, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and I understood at that point that you just 
you have to have some substance behind what you're saying. And I didn't. And, and it, you know, but I learned, you know. So, so then you just probably started recording peop- like people around, just so I'm going to chop some wood, get some stuff. Yeah. Well, I was very fortunate. When I was at Connecticut Recording in Bridgeport, uh, Lekka came to me one day, and he, showed, he had this band that it was contacted him about doing something. And he... It was a kind of a post-punk band. Okay. They were called The Neighborhoods from Boston. And yeah, they, sure. They were very popular. You probably there. brought me there. I think I remember I think being I on did. some of those. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't really know what to do with it. He says, you know, why don't you talk to him? So I did, and we got along, and I ended up doing two records with them, both of which ended up on... The first one was an indie record, and then the second one, we got signed to Enigma Records in California, which ultimately was like where Poison came from. Sure. And, all these big bands and they liked the band and they signed it and they put out the record on their, they had like a, an under label called the yeah. Virgo, which was uh, you know, kind of like the farm team, you yeah, know? but yeah, they yeah. put it out on there and then the next record was supposed to be on there. So, um, you know, it, that happened there and that really got me going. And then after that, then you're a, a producer. Yes, exactly. Now you could say, well, I did this. Yeah. And then I got a call from the new Johnny five, Oh, in wow. New London, who were doing fantastic in Connecticut. Mm. Uh, they were kind of a oddball, sort of a reggae-ish rock thing. Yeah, you yeah. know, a lot of synthesizers, yeah. a lot of like Thompson. It should have been the 80s. Yeah, 80s, really 80s kind of thing. And they asked me to make a record for them, and they had a backer, so we, we went and did that. And, you know, it, that did pretty well. So, you know, it kind of just got me going into where you could function. Yep. Yeah. You know. And then, uh, that and that's along. either at CRS or at your place. You had your place. I was doing, yeah, my place. We were doing a little bit of stuff, but we were also using a presence recording in Hamden, in uh, East right. Haven, a lot. Right, right. With uh, John Russell did sure. stuff, and sure. uh, so we got that stuff done. And then uh, I was working at my home studio, which had, was actually pretty advanced at the time. We were written up in a couple of big magazines and stuff. And I got a call one day from a guy uh, who John Russell at Presence had referred to me, and. John said, these guys are crazy. They own this house and they want to make a studio and it's never going to work, but you could talk to them. I said, oh, gee, thanks. Yeah, great. So they came over and um, they also wanted to record country songs. Oh. They were writing songs and they had never written songs in their life. But the deal was they had bought this house and I think the house bit them in the ass yeah. and made them write songs because the house was owned by Ace Frehley from Kiss. Oh, uh, okay. And the guy, there was a woman and a guy. The guy had, was like filthy rich. Okay. His family owned a shipping a shipping company in Norway, and they would just show, well, you know, he owned this, and it'd be like a you know four hundred foot <laughs> tanker with his initials on the stacks. Hey, that's you know? cool. <laughs> and so I said to him, I said, you know, would you be interested in starting a record company with me? And he said, no, not interested. Wow. However, yeah, I own. I'd this like house. to give you a barge. <laughs> exactly. You know, he says, however, I own this house that I bought for my wife and my family to live in, and my wife hated the house. So I had to buy her another house. Oh, wow. And I, so I'm, I, I was going to throw this one away. Exactly. If you want it. <laughs> so I, he owns this Ace Frehley house. <laughs> and right at that time, real estate in Southern Connecticut crashed like a rock. It was like 1989. I, so sure. he bought this house for, 50, uh, for a mill and a half from Ace Frehley. And all of a sudden, if he wanted to sell it to get out from under it, it was like 900000 He's like, I don't want to eat $600,000. How about if we get together and open this recording studio that is in the basement. And I went, I went down and saw it was gorgeous. Yeah, right. You know, it was, there's was no equipment in it, but the room itself looked yeah. like the Hit Factory. In fact, it had been designed by the and guy. Ace that, did have anything in there? No, Ace took all the stuff and sold it and okay. moved back to New He didn't like living in the country. Okay. You know, he did yeah. crazy things. Like one day he took his car and drove it through the uh, front door of the house. Oh, cool. Because <laughs> yeah. his, his wife locked him out of the house. Hey. So. You know, I should so do that. Normal guy, you know, how do I get it? Well, I'll just drive through, you know. So yeah, that's did. cool. Stuff like that. So, he, But he didn't like living there, so he moved, sold everything, and so we had an empty studio. But he says, well, look, my family is, you know, I can't. I have credit. I can, we can get sure. whatever we need. Let's just buy it. Sure. So we went out, we got all this stuff, and set up the studio, and then, well, next question. So I, at the time, was doing trade shows for Allen & Heath, the uh, right. a mixer company. Sure that we had met when we were at Trodden Also. We knew them from there, and Chuck Augustowski, who was our sound man, had, had become the president of Allen & Heath US. Okay. Because he bought a lot of stuff from him. And so 
I used to do the trade shows and I would meet a lot of people. And one of the people that I met and we used to hang out with was this guy, Willie Wilcox, who sure. was the drummer for Todd Rundgren's band. Sure. And he was the drummer on Bat Out of Hell, Meat yep. Loaf. He was yep. a, a very... He had a drum set that looked like a motorcycle. That's right. Remember? Right. And he sang, <laughs> I, I don't want to work. I just want to bang on the drum all day. Right. So I had met him and he's like, well, you know, I know everybody and I'm looking to move from the West Coast to the East Coast and I need a place to put a studio. And he said, well, I happen to have perfect space. And we had, it wasn't even the main room. We built him a second room in the house. He put all this stuff in there. He was doing like dance music. Sure. And, but he comes in one day and he says, I mean, two things happened from him that were really critical. First thing, uh, well, I know this guy, Mike Chapman, who lives in Easton. Sure. Which was like 10 minutes from the yep. studio. Yep. Who was Mike Chapman? Mike Chapman was, yeah, he produced was like everything. Puffy in the 70s. That's right. Basically. Yeah. I mean, every week he was on the cover of Billboard yeah, magazine. crazy. He did uh, Blondie Parallel Lines. He did The Knack, Get My Sharona. He, he, and before that... The Sweet. Right. Yeah, and, it starts. Uh, that might be where it started. Oh, Susie Quattro. Mm -hmm. He did that. It used to be on Happy Days. So, I mean, he was huge. Yeah and, yeah. and he saw the place and he was like, well, if you can make this work, I'm going to just be here all the time. Because he didn't want to go to New York. Yeah, right. He lived in Easton. We were like 10 minutes away. Sure. And also, what he liked is that we would keep the artist there. You know, we mm -hmm. were going to use it like a, a hotel sort of Yeah, thing. yeah. So the first thing he shows up with, he brings Lita Ford. Nice. Who was, you know, very popular at the time. And she's a really nice person, really, really fun. We, you know, set her up in the master bedroom in sure. the house. And uh, they lived there for like six months. Wow. And they had cut the tracks already. It had been cut in L.A. Uh, with a pretty good studio band. Myron Grombacher was the drummer. Sure. You'd appreciate Pat that Benatar. from Pat Benatar. And uh, you remember Myron, Don Morris? Yeah. Myron Grombacher, Pat Benatar's drummer. You don't remember watching him on MTV? With the, his drums were uh, uh, camo. Yeah. Camo, anyway, camo sorry. Part, yeah. So they came in, and they were just stayed there forever. And uh, I didn't even work the sessions too much. He was bringing up engineers from New York, from the, from the Hit Factory. They're all really good guys, yeah, nice yeah. guys. But re and I learned everything from You're them. You're getting on the map. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, was like, I was like basically the studio owner to everybody else. So it was really good. We met a lot of people. Mike, you know, I, I, still, I still see Mike once in a while. I saw him not too long ago. Cool. And uh, fantastic guy and just put again put us on the map yeah and then the next thing that happened was crazier uh oh um, then ace freely ace freely drove through the door again no no instead <laughs> just... instead of ace freely driving through the door this guy jerry goldstein drove into the place and jerry goldstein uh, he was a super successful songwriter people yep. don't really know about this guy too much but him rich Goderer, who who started the orchard with sony uh and one other guy who was kind of the less known guy they, they were called uh PPC or so they had a name, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. they were a songwriting conglomerate. They wrote "I Want Candy" by the Strames Loves. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were in the band of, of yeah, that. Right. They did that. They wrote, uh, and this was interesting because uh, when I was at Trodnasel, this guy used to come in and he pr pr he sort of made it look like he produced "The Angels" my boyfriend's back. Well, these guys actually did write oh, "My wow. Boyfriend's Back," wow. and they actually produced it, and um, you know. And he, at the time, was managing two bands. He was managing War, and he was managing Sly Stone. Oh, boy. Who was I remember this. an idol of mine. I, sure. mean, I was just so yeah. enamored with him. Yeah. And their whole thing was they wanted, is, they did tell me the whole story. They wanted to bring Sly Stone to the East Coast, park him at our studio, and make a record there in time to get out for the second Woodstock. Oh. Because he had been so popular at Woodstock, yeah, they yeah, just thought yeah, yeah. this will be how we're going to launch. And he'll come this out thing. of the wilderness. Now, of course, what they didn't tell me was that he was an incorrigible crackhead, sure, beyond belief, right, and that they were the mafia. <laughs> so, wow, wow, hey. So the way it works, talk so about they, things you don't need to nah, know. You don't need <laughs> to know. So they bring Sly up, and we put him in the same bedroom that Lita Ford had been in. And oh boy! First thing he does is he puts a newspaper all over the walls, sure. so that people won't see him. And there's like little. Sure. Uh, torches everywhere oh. and that stuff that you clean pans with so I, of course I'm an idiot I have no idea yeah, about yeah, any yeah, of this yeah, yeah. I was like, what's going on with this you got these you're like oh man he's oh, in there cooking it up oh that's yeah. how you cook crack so he was of course out of his mind but he was still a, just a beautiful person and the most talented human being you're ever meet yeah. in your entire life this guy was yeah 
beyond a genius, you know. That's great. You tried to get, I remember you tried to get me involved. I did. You called I, it and said, you got to come down. Yeah. I never made it down. Yeah, well, it, you know, there was, it got very dicey, trust yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it went on for about, I, I worked with him for almost a year and a half. And wow. at, the, at the end of it, he was still living at the house um, wow. and, and working. And um, I got, one of the mafia guys pulls me aside one day and he says, well, you better be really careful. Something really bad is going to happen next week if you're not careful. I'm like, oh, what could that be? So I'm thinking, 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 and I finally figured it out one night after three nights of not sleeping at all. They were going to bust him for because he was on parole. Oh, they were they caught up with him. They figured well, out where they it was. were going to turn him in themselves because that was the because he was starting oh. to get away from them, and they didn't want that. So they're just like, we'll just drop a dime on you. Exactly. They'll, they'll take him back to California. They'll put him in jail. And if he wants to get out in jail, he, they're gonna, he's going to have to call us because we're going to be the guys oh. who bail him out, which is exact, exactly what happened. Oof. Um, so I didn't see him for a long time. And then about. I hope you went to lunch that <laughs> hour. You're like. <laughs> no, they, they were all out. They surrounded the studio. And then finally, some guy walks up out of the bushes and he. Oh, man. What's up? We're looking for Slice. Sylvester Stone. Stewart. Okay. That's, However, uh, the problem was I had called the FBI. Because I figured it out. Oh, boy. And I called the FBI and I said, look, if there's somebody that you're looking for, and I tell you his name, would you yeah. tell, tell me if you're looking for him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I told them. And yeah. they said, well, well, we'll call you back in 45 minutes. Oh, we'll boy. let you know. We got to check through the files and everything. 45 minutes, the place was surrounded. Oh, and they take him to the, the jail in Bridgeport. Ooh. Three hours later... Knock, knock, knock. We're looking for Sly Stone. Who are you? We're the FBI. Oh, man. Well, you're kind of late. The FBI was here a few... What do you mean they were here? How could that be? They had no idea that I had called them. These were the FBI from New Jersey oh. that the mafia guys <laughs> knew, <laughs> and they were coming to take them away. So you so, had two FBI's out That's right. In one day. Oh. In one day. And uh, so they take How, them. Did Sly go quietly? Yeah. He just was like, all right, you he got He called me. me two hours later from Bridgeport. He said, you bring me my slippers. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story. Yeah. So I go down to Bridgeport. Were they pink slippers. fuzzy? They no, they weren't. They were just slippers, you know. Uh, know. But uh, so we go, and they take, and I didn't see him for years. Five, six years ago, I get a call from an attorney on the West Coast who's representing Sly Stone, mm. and he says, "We're suing the management company for fifty million dollars. Fifty million dollars. That's not you, is it? No, no. Okay. It was Jerry Goldstein, the guy from War. Gotcha. So what had happened was they Man. had taken all Sly's publishing and put it in parallel companies that had just like one letter different. What? And they're not even really supposed to be able to do that because they were insiders, they knew how to do it, and they got away with it. So all the money was going to them because that's oh. what the guy had come. He had, you know, so they set up all these shell, shell companies. Fake yeah, yeah. Publish. And at that time, like right after that, uh, just before that actually, <laughs> Toyota was using uh, Everyday People for the, as their number one song for like oh. three years. Yeah, yeah. That's like a lot of money. And uh, so they sued him, and uh, they didn't get the $50 million, but they did get five. Wow. So, I mean, just weird shit happens. And then he just, off he went out into your orbit. Well, that's when you started seeing stuff on the, the internet of him living in a van in Oakland. Right, right. You know, if you ever saw any of that. Yeah. And so, you know, we, I asked him about it. He said, well, I, I like living in the van. It wasn't like he was homeless. He just liked living in the van. So wow. he's an amazing guy. Yeah, I'm bet. trying to get him to sing on a song now because I just cut uh, one of his songs with one of my other artists. Wow. Uh, and wow. I'm, I'm hoping they'll sing on it if I can find them. You know? Wow. That's wild. Yeah. A that, lot of wild stuff happens. That's crazy. Know? So you're glad you work with them. It wasn't oh, a letdown. Oh, no, it was not a letdown at all. all right. I mean, it was unfortunate because nothing ever really came of it in that regard. Yeah. By the same token, I mean, the, re the thing that happens, and I'm sure Christine could tell you the same thing. You know, people in Connecticut, they do this stuff, and they all like, well, I wrote a hit, or I did a this. I said, well, you know, how do you know it's a hit? Yeah. Have you ever been in the room when a hit was being made? Mm. Well, I have, and she has. You know, if you've been around, you realize that it's different. Mm -hmm. It's not just like you go in the studio, and you. it's like there's a vibe that happens when yeah. it's a hit. Is, is that true? It is. Wow. It's totally true. Yeah. You know, you might you don't even know when it's happening because you don't know that it's going to be a hit, but mm. you can feel that it's special. Yeah, you know, and that's different than just somebody coming in and this some that Banging guy's it out. singing a song and yeah. you know telling you it's a hit. I said, well, you know, with all due respect, you have no yeah. idea. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that I do either. By the way, all I'm saying is that you definitely don't. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. That's wild. Yeah, huh. crazy stuff. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that. You're like you would come downstairs and he would have the, just the most bizarre 
genius, crazy stuff yeah, yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah. One night he says, because, <laughs> you know, I used to bust his balls about the drugs all the time. Yeah, sure. I'm like, you know, it's like, dude, you are so talented. You don't need this. Could we just, just get rid of this? You'll be yeah, able to yeah. get on with your career, you know. So he said, oh, I'm, 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 come on down. 11 o'clock tonight. Come on. We're going to I'm going to show you how it all works. Okay. So 11 o'clock, I get a phone call. Let's go to the studio. So we start working and it's fantastic. Wow. Between like 11 and 2, it's fantastic. So like, you're seeing it. You're seeing oh, yeah. like this is what he does. Fantastic. Wow. Now at 201, yeah, he yeah, gets yeah. out the crack pipe. <laughs> right. Then it just, wheel, the wheels and come up. He starts just dismantling it. You know, it's like, I'll get rid of that part. And he oh. takes something really great and he wants me to erase it so he can do some nonsense. Oh. You know? And like about. So he really needs a producer uh, well, yeah. to just go stop. Well, he is a producer, but he can't, he does, he he can't control himself. Right, 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 right. Sure. By four o'clock in the morning, it was just nothing. So it's. G wow. Nothing. But you heard it happen I heard and it, then you heard it. I go. heard it go up and I saw so it come down. So it's genius plus drugs. Nothing. Can't wow. help. Can't do it. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I wonder, was he like that before drugs? You know, like, is that how I, much of it I is I doubt genius? it, because before drugs, he was finishing things. Yeah, no. Yeah, you know, no you look shit. at all those great yeah, yeah. songs. Yeah, there's <laughs> nothing better. He No, there isn't. I no, mean, no. he invented an entire genre. Yeah. I mean, when I was working with him, he's trying this. Is, we'd be on the phone, we'd ring as uh, George Clinton. Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> sure. I got to talk to Sly. Yeah, yeah. Two hours later, ring. This Prince, got to talk to Sly. I mean, he was Whoa. the guy. So they knew know? where to find Sly. Oh, they, they, and they knew what he, you know, they knew that sure. he invented it. You know, they wanted to talk to him. No doubt. Wow. It was very interesting. That's crazy. Um, take us back real quick to, so you started as a drummer. Right. Talk about that a little bit, how that all start. Well, Beatles. Yeah, you know, yeah. It was simple, you know. We, yeah. We went to see the Beatles and it was fantastic, you know. Um, I mean, I remember in sixth grade getting yelled. I used to take drink stirrers from my father's bar. Yeah, yeah. And I'd bring him to class and I'd bang him on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and be like, We're going to throw you out of class if you don't. Oh, come on. Just like every kid. Yeah, sure. And then I got a, I got a big marching drum for a mm -hmm. minute and I learned how to kind of do that stuff. And then uh, by seventh grade, I had a band with uh, two other kids. Yeah. Uh, no, ba two guitar players. Two guitar players and me. Oh, that's cool. We were called the Trippers. The Trippers. But this was wow. before that meant anything. Right. You, you know, just we were like we're going we're on a take, trip. Exactly. We're yeah. going to go to New York. We're going to yeah. go there. Yeah. You know, later it was like, oh, the Trippers. I mean, yeah. What's up with you guys? But Did uh, you start with your sister right away? No. No, this was before. I used to play with her. We used to do folk gigs at the local churches. Okay. Actually, even before that, I would play acoustic guitar. I was not very good, but oh. I could play Blowing in the Wind. You sure. Know? And sure. we were doing stuff like that. And, uh, the Episcopal Church in St. Paul's Episcopal in Cheshire. We used to wow. play in the basement. They used to have a coffee house. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, I got into the drum thing, and she wasn't too involved in that for a while. I had a band with uh, two other guys that were pretty well known. This guy, Tom Meccarello, was in my class, and he was a fantastic guitar player. In fact, he's playing with uh, Tommy Emmanuel, so you figure out how good is this guy. Yeah, right. Know? Yeah, sure. Uh, it was him and his cousin, Bob Renato, who was in Bobolero, and he's a fantastic right. guitar player. Okay. And his cousin, uh, or his brother, Alphonse, who was a, he was like a hot rod accordion player who converted to a Farfisa guy. Yeah, right, right. So we started doing that, and uh, then we added, Christine came in and started singing. And <laughs> is this the go go cage years or no? Yeah, probably yeah. <laughs> around, right around that time. Yeah, yeah, because Christine was telling us so, when she was here. Yeah, yeah. So we had a she band. She did some time in the cage. And we were like, go cage. a couple of things happened. We were looking for a bass player. Yeah. And I remember we got this guy, Carl Cornelia from Wallingford. Okay. And he was famous because he had a Camaro. Oh. And oh, that had, guy. Yeah, that yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. And he had a Super Beetle and he had a Hoffner, uh, Hoffner bass. He had all this stuff, you know. So we, and, uh, we, we auditioned a couple of bass players. He was him, and this other guy was this guy, Ellsworth Apgar. Weirdest name ever, weirdest looking guy, except he was a great bass player. But, of course, we hired the other guy because he had, he had the, all the gear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he had a PA and blah, blah, blah. So we hired him. We rehearsed with him for like three months. We go to play the first gig. He still got all the songs on, written on like three by five uh, index cards uh -huh. so he could play them. Well, that wasn't the biggest problem. The problem was when we went walking out to the stage, he dropped them. Right. And, and they, they all, all went got jumbled out of order. up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we play the show. He just plays all the wrong things to all the wrong, doesn't even know, you know. And we're like, oh, this guy's got to go. So we, we went and we got Where's Ellsworth it? back, who yeah. was li really a lifelong friend, a tremendous bass player, yeah. and uh, just a great guy. So that we did that for a while. And then 
at some point, oh, he was still in the band. That was how the band was. We actually, and this woman who lived next door to us, who was a New York singer, shows up one day, and I, I think Christine doesn't think I quite had the story right, and I might not, but this is how I remember it. She shows up and she says, oh, you guys are great. Uh, I'm going to get you a record deal. Okay. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Great. Look, if you want to get us a record deal, fine. You know. yeah, go ahead. Well, which was unfortunate, but she did. <laughs> so, wow. You know, she line, we comes out, well, Friday we're going to New York and we're going to play for all these records. So we played for, like, I think, three record companies maybe on that Friday. It was terrifying. They put us in with some gay guy. We thought he was going to kill us. Um, but he ended up recommending that they sign us. And this guy, this guy, this guy was Bob Shad. And oh, he okay. was like a visionary almost. I mean, right. He yeah. had like two or three, la- he, he had three other bands on the label. One was the Amboy Dukes featuring right. Ted yeah, Christine Dukes. told yeah. us the whole story. One yeah. was Big Brother and the Holding Company with right. Janis Joplin. And then you guys. <clears throat> yeah. And there was another band too, Ultimate Spinach, which of Jeff Baxter was right. the guitar player. Right. You know, so we did some stuff for them. You know, it didn't work out. They dropped us. Oh. But nonetheless, you, you know, we, we were recording at A&R Recording. Freaking Phil Ramone was the engineer yeah, right, on one right, of the right. sessions, you know, before he was Phil Ramone. He was just like, yeah, I'm Phil Ramone, as opposed to... Is this to, when you oh. you started paying attention? So when did you start paying attention to how records were made? Well, after that, when that whole thing fell apart, we went over to Trod Nossel, because we knew they were there, and they basically signed us. Sure. And, you know, there was a lot of... That was a studio. And you was, were called what by then? That was became fancy. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Right after the after the wrong black bag became fancy, right. and uh, you know we were there all the time, and there, mm. we were in a studio. There's crap sure. everywhere, you know. Sure. And I just liked it, you know. So yeah, I I started doing a little bit of that for, over there, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, work with this person and that person, yeah. and you know, just it was getting more and more into it. Yeah, and and uh, honestly, I, I hate to say I got less into drums, but I, I kind of just started to feel more like, well, this is where I want to be, yeah. rather than carting around a drum set. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So you gave all your gigs to me. Right. So that I could... Or at least half of them. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. (laughs) Quite a few of them I gave to you. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, that happened. I was there for a long time, and Mm -hmm. then that fell apart because we weren't. we're not going to go into all that. Sure. But it fell apart, and I ended up at Paul Lekka's place in Bridgeport. Right. Where I finally found somebody that really knew what was going on. Right. Because as much as they told us they knew what was going on at Tradnossel, oh. I later found out that most of that was bullshit. Oh. Um, and how did I find out? From asking Paul, who knew. Oh, boy. <coughs> you know, we would go to New York. At just I would go to New York. We're walking down 42nd Street. And, oh, there's the president of Atlantic. There's this. You know, he just knew yeah, everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's, you know. Yep. From there, it just kind of rolled. Yep. You know. So you were doing both probably when I met you. Yeah, for sure. Kind of doing it all. Not probably more drums. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, it was heading that way. Yep, yep. Do you remember? Was it like a switch, <coughs> or who knows? No, I don't think it was a switch. I think. I mean, I still I love play drums. Drums yeah, are great. Yeah. You know, I love playing them. Yeah, you know? yeah. I just felt like there's a lot of people doing that. Sure. And there's not a lot of people doing this. Sure. So. Yep. You know, and at the time I wasn't even. I didn't even really engineer. I was really a, just a pure producer, which meant you had an engineer. And at some point, kind of early on, I realized, well, if they're going to fire anybody, they're going to fire the producer. Okay. Because they have to have the engineer. Yeah, Nothing right. Nothing works right. without the engineer. Right. Explain to people who might not know the difference up between a producer and an engineer on an on an album project or recording. Okay. Yeah, well, the producer is, <clears throat> is kind of the creative connection to the artist. You know, okay. you help them find the songs. Or if they have the songs, you help them refine the songs. You help them figure out who's going to play on the songs, unless they have, if they have a band, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but maybe even somebody in the band isn't really good enough to record, so you go get somebody. But your responsibility is all of that kind of stuff. The so it's almost for, I don't want to say normal people, almost like a project manager yeah. in a way. Yeah, right? It is in a project sense. manager. I don't think it's any different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the engineer is largely the technical. Right you know, connection to the studio. I mean, he knows the knobs, he knows the levels, he knows the EQs, yep. stuff like maybe he knows how to mix. Yep. Maybe, you know, one of the, either the producer or the engineer might mix, or it might be somebody else. Sure. But, um, you know, it's it's a more technical and it, as opposed to a more gotcha. intellectual sure. kind of an approach to it. Sure. Yeah, but what I found was that 
they could live without your intellectual input. You yeah, know? right. They right. probably would just be happier without it half the time without some guy saying, well, you should play it like this or, yeah, right, or right. that or do it again. You know, they're like, mm. yeah, go screw yourself. Yeah, right. Um, so they'd fire that guy first. So I, I realized that if I learned how to engineer, I could be in the position of just having it one way or the other. Sure. Because they couldn't really get rid of me. And sure. it, it sort of was true. You know? So then you focus on engineering. Well, I, I figured I had to got learn to a it. point where you're like be more indispensable, yeah. more essential. Yeah, I mean, I already knew how to do the producing part, not successfully, yeah. really, but I, I knew how to do it, you know, and I was good at it, the language, I knew mm -hmm. how to talk to musicians and stuff like that. Um, but I had to learn how to do the engineering part just because otherwise I'd be paying somebody a whole bunch of money that we really yeah, right. didn't have because most of these records did not have budgets. Right. You know, it was a question of doing it. Like even, the, you know, the Neighborhoods record, I, I funded one of wow. them, the first one somebody else funded. And then after that was done, I said, well, we're gonna, we should make another record. Yeah. And I just paid for it, you know. I, wow. Uh, why? Because it was the only way that they would let me do it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. they'd find somebody else who would pay for it and let him do it. Whoa. So that's just the reality of it you yeah, know, at yeah. the time, you know. Did it pay off? It did. Oh, it good. paid off tremendously because cool. they were a really popular group in Boston. And you thought, this will be the one I could right. get. I need something to hang my hat on, yeah, yeah. And, and that was it. Yeah. The, rec the first record did quite well. Yep. You know, I met the people at BCN. I sure. was up there, Oedipus and those guys. Yep. Um, they liked it. You know, we, we let them even, you know, one of the things I learned early on is let them comment on it. And, it, you know, if he says, oh, I think you should make this a little louder, go home and make it a little louder. Oh, wow. They'll love you for it. Yeah, you know, yeah, They'll, yeah, they'll yeah. feel important, and they'll play your record. I see. And they did. So, you know, we did that, and then we did the second record we did was a top 10 college record um, called The High Hard One. Okay. Which had a, a really good song on it called WUSA, which was, you know. Sure. At the time, you know. Yeah, CMJ, yeah. College Media Journal, was the, the Bible of yep. college radio. I don't think it's quite that anymore. I think. Maybe not. But at the time it was, yep. and if you could make that happen, you know, they had a convention every year. Sure. You could go to the convention, meet people. Yep. Um, so I used, and I used to do all that stuff. I mean, I, I, I learned early on that, you know, hanging around New Haven wasn't going to help all that much. So I used to go to those, con I used to go to a lot of different conventions. Yeah. Cool. Helped a lot. Yeah. Know. And do you feel like you're still, so what's the status now as far as you're still moving forward? You're yeah. just still moving people, moving people through trying to click. It's got to be all different now. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's, Independent is independent. You sure. Know, you have to be responsible for yourself. You right. Know, and, uh, and that's how you started. So yeah, it just is. right. So, I mean, I kind of knew it early on. And uh, I, I never really managed to get in bed with the bigger record companies, you know, I, I, which I kind of regret, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I wish I had, but I just didn't feel like I fit in there. Yeah. It was a little sleazy. It was a little, yeah. you know, they would take advantage of artists. And I just really didn't like that. I got gotcha. you. Um, but so you'd rather be more of an advocate yeah. for the artist rather yeah. than, than a, than a, yeah, I don't know. Sure. Sure. <laughs> a crook. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which a lot of them are, you know, and wow. I, trust me, I know a lot of them. So, and I yeah, can tell yeah. you, you know, all of their little scams and sure. how they do it and everything. So, so where are we now? We're kind of in the same place. I mean, I'm actually working with a couple of guys, a few guys that I've met over the years, uh, John Dubuque, who was the partner with Joe Lenane, right, and a company just, called Tex Worldwide. They, yeah, we're they were very involved that. in touring and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, a guy I met at Trod Nossel, who I've known for years, Michael Jeremiah, he's uh, a booking agent. Yep. And a guy named Al Tepper, who was president of Paul McCartney's publishing company. Okay. Small guy. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I, I went to them and I said, you know, I think the way to make this work in today's world is to do everything. Yeah, right. So we'll make the record and yep. then we'll promote the record. Yep. When the record gets up so high, we'll be able to book the band so they go around and play. Maybe we can get them in a movie or a TV show and make some yep. money there. Whatever yep. it is, we don't want to rely on other people because when they rely on other people, they steal the act from you. <laughs> Wow. Which is what I have found on more than one occasion. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so I've everyone's like, it. oh, thanks. Yeah, well, you know, you do, you do a really good job on something, and what happens is somebody shows up and says, well, I could do a better job. <laughs> you know, or if, right. if you were with me, you'd be farther along. Or yeah, it's yeah, their yeah. fault that you're not, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, artists are unfortunately very gullible. Right, you know, and right. 
they don't really know. All they know is I'm here and I want to be here. Sure. And this guy's telling me. Now, of course, that guy had never done anything. Yeah, right, right. So they really didn't know that it was going to work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All they knew was that somebody was telling them it could be better. And a lot, sometimes they would jump ship on you. Yeah, yeah. So my thing was the only way you can get around this is control the whole thing Mm -hmm. and, and, and take care of them properly. So basically, you're like Trod, but you're. Above board. You know, Sorry, I, I have to be honest with you. Trod was a fantastic idea. Yeah. The only problem was... Well, we don't... I mean, you don't have to talk about it. Right, we I'm don't just, want to get into that. But it was a fantastic idea that... But you should, ended up realizing that controlling everything is yeah, the way to go. it was not a bad idea. Right. And so many talented people went through there. Yeah. You know? Unfortunately, they did not really know how to keep them happy. Oh. And that's that was the downfall. Sure. You know? Because that sooner or later, just like it would happen to me, it was no different, really, in yeah, many yeah, ways. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, I just watched it, and I think we were talking about Adam Deitch before. I mean, Adam yeah. Deitch was in a band called Fat Bag. Yeah, great that drummer. I put on the map. You right. Know? Yep. I did put them on the map, and then their stupid manager, who thought he knew everything, mm. uh, signed into a really bad record deal with a, what was called a two-step deal. It wasn't even really a deal. It was a, a like an audition deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that guy who we signed, he decided that he wanted to produce the band because he knew better than me. And he had worked with, he was an assistant engineer on NWA's record. Right. And he thought that that qualified him. And yeah, the fact yeah. of the matter is he had never worked with a band. Yeah, right. Never. So, so he, he had no idea what yeah. to do, you yeah. know. And uh, he totally blew that. And, uh, and that was a done deal, you know. So Yikes. He can't go back and fix it when it's wrecked. It's wrecked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they wrecked it. Bummer. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um. Who were some of your drum heroes that that got you fired up? Well, I think you probably know who my drum heroes were. I think so. I mean, Jim, Jim Keltner is a drum yeah, hero. Sure. Um, uh, <laughs> his name just went right through my yeah, head. Right. Well, Jim Gordon was huge. Jim Gordon was huge. The other guy, Jackson Brown's guy, the guy that... Russ Kunkel. Ru- uh, J- Russ Kunkel. Ru- Russ Kunkel. Russ Kunkel. Yeah. Uh, who's sure. a kid I actually know. Wow. Um, right. Yeah, he's an engineer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those were the, in Ringo. I yeah, love sure. Ringo. I mean, I could never understand the criticism of Ringo. Me neither. But You know, I mean, he did the job. He did it with flair. He, he yep. had parts that yep. are famous parts. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yep. It's like, how could you not understand that? You know? Yeah, but, yeah. but what happened was, is that drummers became very enamored with Neil Peart and people sure. like that. You know, but the fact of the matter is, and I remember this when I was teaching uh, at... Uh, not at Music Inc., but up the street there, up on the... Oh, below R.T. Morris. Right, below What that. was that called? I don't even remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were there for a while, and I, one day I picked up the Modern Drummer, and there's an interview with Neil Peart, and he says, thank Uh-oh. God, he said, if you can't play drums with a bass drum, a snare drum, and a hi-hat, you're not a drummer. Great. And I was like, cool. thank you. Well, it's kind of like what we were talking about before. Like, some people are freaky. They have more than most people. Yeah. So they're able to do that, but they have the fundamentals, where most of us get... Like, I'm good at the fundamentals. I don't have that big a gift to do everything else. You don't need that else. big a gift, really. Right. You know? Well, depending on what you want to do. Yeah. I mean, talk to Mickey. Talk to Mickey Curry. Right. Yeah. I mean, excellent drummer. Yeah. Plays great. He's I mean, one he's of my heroes. He's got some licks, you know, yeah. but, but he's not, he doesn't live by the licks. He lives by the group. But he's made hit records. Many. Yeah. Hit records. Many. I, hit yeah. Records. I mean, uh, we'll put it this way. Well, actually, my, my wife's pretty slick. I mean, she's not a musician, but she has ears. Yeah. But like... um. You know, I'd be talking to somebody about drummers and Mickey Curry and who, and I just tell her, cuts like a knife. She goes, oh. <laughs> I mean, even she know. you know, yeah, you yeah. hear cuts like a knife and you're like, oh, what a drum track. So I do anything. You know, I mean, he's played on, on some of the biggest records yeah. in the history of records. You know, yep. think about it. You no know. doubt. No and doubt. he's still a sweet guy, easy to talk to, great cool. to hang around with. Cool. You know, I still see him fairly regularly. And, uh, Far out. You know, actually, I think he's leaving. I don't know if he's leaving Technically, but I mean, he's not going on to the next tour. Oh, wow. Uh, I think he's tired of it. Oh, boy. But, you know, that just goes to show that, I mean, things that people would die to have. Yeah, sure. After you have it for 30 years, you might be like, yeah, maybe I'm done with this. Wow. wow. But so many people, I mean, the, the real difference in, in making things work is who you know. Sure. And how you know. Them. Yep. Because they give you information mm-hmm. that you just can't get anywhere else yeah you know how do you find that out you know i mean if you could sit down and talk to jim gordon about recording layla you know how much (laughs) how much information could you get 
just doing that as a musician. Good you know? Lord. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's unbelievable. Would they remember any of it, though? Right. Not to mention the fact that he played the whole end of the song. I know. You know, most people don't know that, you know. But right. In fact, he wrote the end of the song. Oof, so. I know. How about that? Yeah. And then killed his mother. And then killed his mother because he heard voices. and Yikes. Voices said, kill mom. What a crazy, what a crazy time. That's a bizarre story. That's, that's a bizarre. He's a great, yeah. great drummer. Oh, he's fantastic. You know, yeah. I always loved him, you know, and... Uh, God, I just so, felt so bad when I heard that whole thing. It was like, how did this go on? Yeah, that's crazy. But uh, yeah. mm. all, but those are the guys that, for me, really worked. I mean, I'm, yeah. I don't even know if I can think of a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah, were, yeah. Maybe Simon Kirk or somebody. Yeah, right. He right. was really great, yeah. you know. Um, that's cool. I mean, I did had Liberty DeVito on a session. Not too long. Yeah. It was fantastic. There you yeah. go. Fantastic drummer. Yeah, there's a hit, hit maker. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I play on hit records. Um, you made so hit we, records. The studio uses Bobby Torello most of the time these mm-hmm. days. Johnny Winters from her for yeah. years. And, uh, I want to get him up here, too. Yeah, oh, I'll hook that up. Yeah, cool. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That'll be fun. That'll be hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet that'll be fun. <laughs> He's so funny. Yeah, I don't um, know him that well, so it'll be really, f- it'll be fun because we'll get to know each other. Yeah, well, you'll, I mean, he's just a great drummer. And, yeah. Uh, you know, he's not for everybody. Yeah, well. Nobody is. Nobody is. You yeah. know, but uh, he's really learned. He's really got a lot more discipline later in life. I mean, he plays great to a clay. He yeah. just has a lot of uh, attack. I mean, it just sure. sounds like he means it, you know. Yeah. I can't say that everybody does that. You yeah, know? right. <laughs> I, I hear a lot of drummers, and, you know, they can all play, but they don't motivate you. Bob, yeah. Bobby motivates you. Yeah. That's just all important, you know. Yep. In many think, ways, it's more important than, sometimes it's more important than the notes you play. Yep. Right. I think that's true. Yeah. I mean, I think that's true. So you were my drum teacher. How'd you get involved in that? It's probably out of necessity, just like I did. Yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, I was just like, well, I got to make more money. Yeah, yeah. What am I going to do? Well, I yeah. know how to teach drums. Fine. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, Mark taught me, and Mark Silver at Music King taught me into it. He was the first guy that I ever taught with. Right, right. Just like here, you know. Yep. I mean, I, you yep. know, he had a room, and he's like, yeah, let's... Why don't we do this? That's exactly what Dave did for me. Right. Dave here. Yeah. I had no, you know, this or that. And then when that closed, we moved up to that place underneath whatever that place right. was for yep. a while. Yep. And uh, then I, I think I got out of it after that. I yeah, you were going to people's houses. Yeah, a little bit. To come to the house. Once in a while. Yeah. But it, it started kind of going down the more I was, the, the more I got involved in the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's it running around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, I Don, it was probably like this for him too, but you were like the answer guy. You would just come to my house, and I had a stack of records ready. And you'd be like, what are we doing? I would just be put the needle on the record and go, how's he doing that? I'd be like, oh, okay. It's this or this. Okay, great. How's he doing that? It was just yeah. like one thing after another. Uh, you know, well, drumming is great. And teaching drumming was a lot of fun. It was, it, it was good for the mind to just think about the process of it. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I think people largely don't understand drums too much. Right. Yeah, you know, I really don't think they do. I mean, they just see these guys, you know, yeah, yeah. flailing their arms around and uh, hitting round things, you know. <laughs> it's like so much more than that. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially when you're in a situation where the record is important and the singer, you know, you're supporting the singer. Yep. You know, I, I t- tell this to younger drummers all the time. I say, you know, if you can't support the singer, you are not going to succeed. Right. Well, you know what? I say that all the time. In conversation, and I realized I must have learned that from you because you just said probably because that. Yeah. that was my thing is always like I got to a point where I thought, well, another drummer ain't going to give me a gig, you know. Like if the singer likes you, you're good, right? You know, for, as gig wise. And then anyway, I just like music, so I was more listening to I mean, the whole. I remember song, talking but. about that kind of stuff. I mean, we yeah, used to, yeah. I mean, it was always important to me, and I always, you know, I mean, I, we listen to the. Not, I didn't listen to a lot of like heavy or proggy sort of records. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I was aware of them. Yeah. You know, and I, I, so I knew what Bill Bruford sounded like yeah. and stuff. But more song oriented. Uh, but, you know, I was much more interested in people that were playing with Jackson Brown or Linda Ronstadt or even yep. James Taylor. Yep. Um, people like that. And I liked that kind of drumming. I mean, mm-hmm. that was actually one of the reasons why I think I probably left the scratch band. Because, I mean, George Smith wanted to play a lot heavier stuff. Okay. Like, you know, Bowie and things like that and not that I didn't like the music I just it wasn't what I wanted to play yeah you know? yeah yeah um you know and they were very adamant about doing that and um I, I think it just kind of wore a little thin on me I said well sure. maybe I should be somewhere else 
Well, wasn't wrong. because I didn't like anything else. I just didn't seem like the right place to be at the moment. Yeah, yeah. well, that happens. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Music um, does that to you. We got, we're getting towards the end. Okay. Anything you want to touch on that we haven't, that uh, you feel like you want to? Not really. I don't want you to go, man, what not? you can always come back. We've also, Christine knows, once I pass the 50 mark, then I just have people come back now because I've already had a few comebacks. Or sure. Come back at any time. What? Edwin Hawkins. Okay, well, oh. okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I first moved to, uh, well, when I was at Bridgeport yeah. with Paul Lecca at the studio, uh, we were doing a record for this girl, Angela Clemens, who was just a remarkable young black singer. Okay. And um, we were making a record. We were doing a cover of the song, Give Me Just a Little More Time. I love that song. Yeah. Since I was a little kid. Right. And uh, this guy, Michael Brown, was the keyboard player. And he brought this guy in, uh, Jonathan Dubose, who at the time was just looking. He had this funny little Japanese-looking Strat guitar. Okay. And all the other guys were like, who's this kid? You know? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. Look at that guitar. It's stupid. You know? He starts playing. And he's like, he, knew, he did that thing that... You know, that yeah, yeah. rhythmic sort of thing that Nile Rodgers made so much money off of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, he did it way before that, and he did it as good or better. And so by the end of the session, he was like, yeah, you can hang around, <laughs> you know. So John uh, ended up moving to Oakland. Okay. And the next time I saw him, I walked in. I was doing a remote recording at Southern okay. in Lyman Auditorium, the round thing. Yeah. And, and it was of uh, the Edwin Hawkins singers. Oh. Gospel, Oh Happy Day. Yeah, 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 so, yeah. And... So I walk in, and who's playing guitar but Jonathan Dubose? What, what are you doing here? Oh, I, I play with these guys. Of course, it was fantastic. Wow. You know, that's crazy. We sort of reconnected and started doing a whole bunch of things. And then when I went to West Haven, the first thing that happened was a whole bunch of really great gospel records with different people. One was uh, TFT Choir from uh, Bridgeport, fantastic choir. And then I got involved with a thing called Youthful Praise, which to this day is one of the biggest things wow. in gospel. And uh, the guitar player was always Jonathan Dubois. Yeah, right, right. You just get that guy. And then he went, and he, there's a fantastic group that we use all the time for singers in, in West Haven called Kevin Monroe and Devotion. Okay. They're fantastic. I can't even tell you. They, they sound yeah, like yeah. the Fifth Dimension or something. Yeah, They're yeah, so, yeah. so sophisticated in their parts, yeah. and their phrasing is immaculate, and uh, it's great. And so they came to me one day and said, we're doing a record, we want you to do it. And uh, it was a remote, and uh, so who's, who's producing? Edwin Hawkins. Whoa. So I was just like, oh, my God. This oh, is great. man. So, you know, Edwin came east, and uh, we did the Like first the Sly record. Stone of gospel. Yeah, really. <laughs> he, actually, he was. He invented what is, him and Andre Crouch really invented what is contemporary gospel. Yeah, right, right. And he was the nicest guy, and we got along great. And uh, we ended up doing two albums together. Wow. And Edwin was just one of those guys, you know, you put him in a room, and he's listening to them sing, and he's like, oh, let's see, uh, let's you over there, you're flat. <laughs> you know what I Whoa. mean? It's like, well, how do you know? Well, I just know. Who I'm is. Edwin Hawkins. Yeah. So. He's, he's, oh. I mean, his ears were like bigger than North America. Wow. And uh, that was just great. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing that happened that was really great over there was, and unfortunately was motivated by something not so great, which was the Newtown Massacre of oh, the boy. Kids. So I got a call from Jonathan Dubose again, my really my longest friend in the music business, I think, at this point. Because you didn't laugh at him because, <laughs> yeah, because you heard it. True. You were like, this guy's, yeah, right. You know, we've always gotten along. So he calls me up. What do you mean? I'm playing with Harry Connick Jr. Oh, okay, so what's up? Well, we want to do a record for the, uh, the kids in Newtown. Sure. Why? Jimmy Green, Harry's saxophone player, had a kid that was killed there. Oh. The worst. So would you, well, you have, well, of course I'm going to do the yeah, record. Yeah, 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 yeah. Say, Are you nuts? Yeah, yeah. And so we got all this gospel people that we knew, and that's because that's what he was looking to have gospel people do it. And Harry wrote this fantastic song. And uh, Harry, by the way, is just the nicest person. Yeah, I could imagine. He's I just, imagine that. he has no ego yeah, at yeah, all. Yeah, I, yeah. I've never seen anything like it. He's, for somebody that good. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And he's just, yeah, what's up? <laughs> you know? And uh, so he came up and we did the record and it, it uh, came out just beautifully that's cool and uh it went to number one on the apple chart well like the day it came out it was sure. number one and um just fantastic so wow. i mean think you know you you bump into you get to do these things sure 
All I could say is some of it's dumb luck. Some of it is you make your own luck. Some of it is whatever it is. But if you're fortunate enough to be able to be in the room with that stuff. Yeah, right. You can pass that on because you saw it. You know what it is. You right. Know, and you know what it feels like. Yeah. And you also know when it's not there, you know. I like, got we're, you. we're not getting this right. We got it. something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Right. Because you've been there when it went right. Yeah. So you know. SWV was another one I did. Right. Uh, SWV, the, the, you know, sold three million records. Sure. Uh, who knew when we were doing it? Yeah, yeah. There were yeah. just three girls from the Bronx. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of them had really long fingernails. You know, big deal. Right. Uh, okay. They drove up in a van that looked like a World War II submarine and had so much rust <laughs> on it. You know, and and they came in and they were young and they were and they just fun killed them. And the guy that was producing them was cool, and we everybody got along, and and we made the record. And uh, one day I went out to the mailbox and there was a plaque there for. Two and a half mil. So hey. It was nice. Cool. You know? But you don't know how it's going to happen, why it's going to happen, or when it's going to happen. You know? Far out. Uh, you know, Whitney Houston showed up one day with, with Bobby Brown oh. when they were doing the TV show. We did Whoa. a lot of music for that. That's funny. So you get to do things, and again, you know, that's, I could keep saying the same thing, but it's you work with these people that have some skin in the game. Yeah, yeah. And you learn what it feels like, and you can pass that on to other people. When you're doing the records. Well, I appreciate it. And everybody does. Yeah, well, you were fantastic. And, well, and I'm happy that you're still working and able to function. Doing something. Able to function. Yeah, I'll start there. Close am, enough. I'm you know? able to function. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you know, you you, uh, you were my teacher. And that's pretty much what I'm doing now. So well, that helped. I mean, that too, in addition to all the playing. You know, everything. when you came out to play for Hawkins French, mm. they were like, well, we're just going to use that guy all the time. Hey. And whenever the record comes out, if they're doing shows, you'll be doing the shows. Cool. And, uh, Love it. And anything else like that. Because, I mean, you have a tremendous, uh, what am I, I'm like plugging this guy. Now. You, don't have to, you don't have but to. But I will, because um, there's not a lot of people around that can play under the way you can. And that's what we call it. Oh. You know, you can, you still motivate the song, but you're not dominating the song. You're yeah. complimenting the song. And a lot of drummers can't do that. You know? Well, you put, you I, now that we're talking about it, it, you taught me that, that sensibility. I remember. I was young enough to go, it. I want to be like my hero, Vic, so I will take that approach. Hmm. And I mean, so. you know, uh, it's funny because a lot of people didn't like the way I played back in that era. Really? They a lot of people don't like the way like I played. They all wanted to be like Bobby Torello because he, right, right. well, he was, you know, he played double bass. Yeah, he yeah, played yeah. all this stuff, you know. It's all right. I mean, he's a great, he's a great guy, but I just didn't want to play like that. Sure. And in New Haven, he was the gold standard, and sure. so I was just some guy. You know? Sure. Well, that's all right. I mean, I'm kind of the same way. Some yeah. people get it. I, I mean, I'm happy with Some it. Some people don't. I'm fine with it. Yeah. You know, I was happy enough with it. Yeah. Um, we're getting close to the end. Okay. Real quick. Uh, weird questions. Um, well, actually, not that weird. Desert Island albums, a few that would define. Rubber Soul. Sure. Is my favorite of those, I think. Um, Asia. Sure. Maybe Katie lied. I can't tell okay. which one would be that. Yep. Um, but then Axis Bold as Love, mm, mm-hmm. you know, just fantastic. Those are the records. ones. Yeah. Um, Sweet Baby James. Yeah, sure. Maybe that one. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure if I sat here thinking, I'd yeah, yeah, yeah. Moment. But those are the ones those that are good. You know, those go with that. Really stick with me. Yeah. Pet Sounds. Yeah. And yeah, more so the singles. I mean, like, to me, like, God Only Knows is like the greatest song ever written. Agree. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. I can't. I can't top that. Desert uh, Island food. What do you eat and say? I could have this every day. Sushi. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna see sushi all, all Easy the enough. Time. Yeah, sure. That's cool. All right. Well, next time we do this, you have to leave me out at dinner because I don't know anything about sushi. Well, you will after but, you come out with me. Yeah. Well, Paul. <laughs> yeah, Paul is into it. Maybe you guys could. Yeah, we'll do that next time. Yeah. Don, no, he probably you know sushi. Yeah, I'm not a fan. If you knew oh, sushi, really? oh, okay. as I, like I knew sushi. Oh, <laughs> if you knew well, Don's sophisticated. I'm not, I'm not. He is. I'm saying he's, Don, he's worldly. He I don't believe he's really a drummer. I listened to that at dinner, and I was like, this is not a drummer. No, Don's he's a great... way smarter than most drummers. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. That much is true. If that's what you mean, then yes. Hey, he said yeah. some pretty deep stuff, you know? Oh, yeah. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm glad to have everybody here. Yeah. This is cool. This is a cool day. Okay. My mom's here. Mom. Hey, Mom. mom. I've known mom since you. Yeah, you know? since me. Yeah, so yeah. That's a long time. Yeah, Christine's here, brother and sister. Missed your dad. He was fantastic. You yeah, know, my like, dad. That was a great guy. Yeah. 
Yep, Don's here. Everybody's here. Dave's here to shut everything off. So right. you know what? We're That's, gonna go. All right. Thank you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate. Oh, it. I really love. Means a I lot. love going through it. You know, talking about it makes it real again. You know. Cool. I'm glad I could do that. Yeah. After you, all that you've done for did. me and everybody, we appreciate it. Vic Steffens, the king of them all. That's him, right? See you, kids. Yeah, see you, kids. John Peckman Podcast. Connecticut Valley School of Music and Dance. Beautiful downtown Portland, Connecticut. Come to over the bridge, under the bridge, beyond the bridge. One set of lights. Over the woods, over the river, and through the woods. That's right. You rent to your mom's house. That's right. Vic Steffens was here. My mom was here. Don Moores was here. Christine Ullman was here. Dave Kosminski was here. Thank you, kids. I appreciate it. Listen. Dave will tell you how to have your very own podcast here in our studio. Thanks for listening. Drive safe. That is all. If you'd like to start your own podcast, give us a call at Connecticut Valley School of Music and Dance. Our professionally designed podcast space is here for all your recording needs. Rent out our studio to do interviews with up to four people to record audiobooks, social media content, and all other recorded material. Our rentals include a private studio along with our professional-grade podcasting equipment, and we can customize your output to whatever your needs are. We also have green screen capabilities, which will expand to uh, video capability if you so wish. So uh, check us out here at convalley.net forward slash podcast.